All right, well, we're very pleased to have Dr. Oliver Sachs with us today. Dr. Sachs is a physician and a professor of neurology and psychiatry at the Columbia Medical University Center. Uh, he's also the author of more than 10 books, some of which I have here. So for example, we have The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, Awakenings, Musicophilia, Seeing Voices, and the most recent one today that we're going to talk about is The Mind's Eye. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Sachs. Uh, what I wanted to do was to talk about, or to ask you questions about the, one of the last chapters, it's Persistence of Vision, where you talk about, you document your declining vision in the right eye. And as some background, at one point you make reference to Edwin Abbott's Flatland where you say that you experience, you mentioned that you experience your own overwhelming flatness and that you lost your fear of heights. So for those of you not familiar with Flatland, can you describe what it's like, what this life is like in this fictional world and what resonated with you about that? Um, uh, this was a book which was written, I think, in the 1880s. Um, and uh, the inhabitants of Flatland um, live seemingly happily on a surface, um, but there have been some strange phenomena occurring in which objects or people seem to emerge and get larger and then disappear. And their theoreticians say there must be another dimension. And uh, or this, although this seems very counterintuitive to the people on Flatland, mm -hmm. um, but uh, I think you probably have to read the book. I'm, I'm more conscious of my own Flatland than, <laughs> than that. Um, by the way, I, I need to make an apology to all of you because I'm not only blind in my right eye, but as happens with people who are blind in one eye, there's a sort of hemi-neglect. <laughs> um, I, I, have to, I have to remember that you are there. This, this um, hemi-neglect has caused many bizarre situations. Um, so not only do I not see people, say, get into an elevator to my right, it doesn't occur to me that anything would happen on my right. <laughs> So, with respect to your losing your fear of heights, um, there's an image. So immediately, I thought of this guy, man on wire, and then the New York skyscraper scene, that one. And for me, when I see that, I can't help but feel queasy. Even though I know it's, I'm not sitting there, it's, it's two-dimensional. And so, I have a couple of questions. One, is it possible that people who can perform under these conditions lack a sense of depth? Um, I doubt it, um, because lacking a sense of depth is somewhat disabling, and especially in situations like this, I, I would think fatal. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but um, uh, but um, this lack of a sense of depth is actually dangerous even for me because I, um, I, I can't see the depth of steps and I can't see the depth of the podium and um, I'm glad we are well onto it. <laughs> so I don't have an explanation for why I can't do that but in any case no, I'll just live no. with that I'll never go there. No, <laughs> um, no I, 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 I didn't like to to look, look down at all, and I'm I'm actually rather surprised at the absence of of autonomic reaction and of fear, but it it seems to be so. So you mentioned, for example, you can be a, you, on Topanga Canyon when you look down, you would feel the you had that fear at that time, right? When you would look down um, the canyon, um, but um, now um, um, well, f fear and thrill, <laughs> and now I now that particular fear and thrill is gone. So I have other ones. Why? <laughs> I'm just curious also why it is that I would feel queasy looking at this. What's happening there? Um, Any ideas? I'm, I'm not sure. 
I, 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 I suspect it's something to do with your semicircular canals, but, but maybe it's just, um, you know, your, your bringing up. And what? Uh, maybe it's just your, your upbringing. Anybody else feel that? <laughs> or am I the only one? You're all safe. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, so when you point out in your book that seeing nothing on the right, hand, on the right side, which you've just described now, you, you mentioned Federico, the uh, 15th century Duke of Urbino, one of them. And so I thought of this guy who's about to appear. Turns out that's him, isn't it? And so I'm curious, he, do you guys explain what this guy did? Um, well, he lost one eye and um, half or rough, nearly half of his visual field, and he felt this made him very vulnerable to attack on the blind side. And so he had his nose removed uh, so that at least something over here could be taken by the left eye. And it worked? Um, I, he wasn't, I think, assassinated. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess that's, that's evidence. <laughs> so, all right, that answers that question. Um, okay, so you mentioned that the only time you see in stereo now is when you're dreaming, and you mentioned the Grand Canyon. And I, I find that when I stand on the rim of the Grand Canyon, it looks flat to me. Do we have the Grand Canyon? Oh, and in fact, it feels like I'm in the Natural Museum, you know, Museum of Natural History. Yeah. Um, um, well, well, one doesn't have stereo beyond about 200 feet or so. Okay. And uh, although you can get stereo beyond 200 feet, if you use a hyperstereoscope, uh -huh. if, if you get a long cardboard tube and put in oblique mirrors, and then basically your eyes are out here, and then you can, you can. Um, you can expand the Grand Canyon. So that's what I have to do next time I go to the Grand Canyon. We have another real picture. There we go. OK. Um, all right, we're moving right along. Uh, the last chapter, the Mind's Eye chapter, where these are people, you discuss, describe people who have become blind. And they really range from people who can visualize very well, people who don't visualize. So you have, on the one hand, John Hull, who I guess, doesn't visualize, whereas the other fellow, Zoltan Tori, can fix the roof on his house. Yeah. Well, well so. this was a, a surprise to me, because I had um, <clears throat> seen a book by John Hull. It's a book he dictated as he became blind in his 40s. Um, and uh, he laments that after a while, he can no longer visualize or imagine the faces of his wife or children. He even says he can't visualize a three. He has to make it in the air and use a sort of performance memory instead of an iconic memory. And um, when I wrote about him, I assumed this was true of, of all blind people. But I got many, uh, sometimes outraged letters from blind people saying that they, on the contrary, despite having lost their sight 20 years earlier, still lived in a, in a very visual world. And sometimes in, in a hyper-visual world. And there is, in fact, this paradoxical species of, of, of the visual blind. So there's no way of knowing if, if Hall, for example, prior to becoming blind, was very good at visualizing or not, to know whether that then, because with Tory, wasn't he? Um, um, yeah, the, uh, the other man was a, a very good visualizer. His father was a, uh, a film director, and he would always ask his son to, to visualize scenes. Um, I am not sure about Tory's vision before. Or you mean Hull or Tory? I, I'm sorry, I, I mean Hull. Yeah, yeah. Um, and. Um, uh, and I, I don't know what determines this sort of thing. When Tory, who was uh, a, 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 a young Hungarian who went to Australia, was working in a chemical factory, a vat of acid exploded in his face. And uh, 
he was he couldn't speak for a while, but he was then told forget forget vision, you know, pay attention to your other senses, and he determined that he wouldn't, but that he would try and make a, a virtual reality of sight, and he seems to have done so very successfully. And he really fixed his own roof. And and, and he fixed his own roof um, one night, uh, and. Um, and, and, and neighbor, neighbors were, were appalled, of, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but he's, he's fine at night, whereas other people are not. I, I, I'm going to add something okay. uh, tantalizingly. Um, beside the blind who lose imagery and the blind who have very good imagery, there is a third group, and these are the blind who hallucinate. And um, something like 15% of people who are blind have very vivid hallucinations. These were originally described in the 18th century. Um, but, however, that is the opening story of my next book. I was told not to ask about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, I was wondering, uh, following along on the vision part, uh, could you talk, or do you know much about uh, those who are blindsided? Um, people whose uh, visual fine processing isn't entirely there, but their actual, their eyes. I said, I mean, did you say blindsided yes. or, or blind sighted? Ah, uh, S-I-G-H-T, so yes, blindsided. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, I, I, was re yeah. I read about them previously, and I also was, mm. had some questions. Um, yeah, this, uh, uh, this is a fascinating phenomenon when people who have no conscious vision, um, um, may make correct guesses as to what's happening around them. And um, this can be quite highly developed, and, uh, and blind people with blind sight can be able to weave their way through, through a series of obstructions. Um, there, um, there seem to be equivalent equivalence to this with other senses, um, although, although deaf hearing doesn't have the nice, doesn't scan like, like blind sight. Right. Um, the, but there's no reason why blind sight should be limited to the blind. And uh, we probably make use of, of all sorts of cues, including subcortical cues ourselves. Would you talk about an interesting case, Ben, was it? Was that just a footnote, Ben, who used echolocation? Oh, oh yeah. To get around? Um, the uh, blind people sometimes talk about facial vision, although this is a, a misnomer, but this is judging the distance and the size and shape of, of objects through um, uh, partly from wind counts on the face, but partly from, from uh, echoing the interpreting the echoes of one's footfalls or, or one's stick. But this boy, Ben, uh, emitted a clicking sound like a dolphin and became extraordinarily expert, so much so that some, some people at school didn't believe he was blind. He, he could jump onto a, onto, onto a narrow pole and he could even play chess. And that is very shoot amazing. Shoot baskets. Sorry? Shoot baskets. Yeah. Um, there is a, um, a YouTube of him. Uh, sadly, he died when he was 15 or 16 from the same malignant tumor he was born with. Um, following up, uh, do you know if uh, those who are blindsided are able to uh, re react very quickly? So like if you like, threw a, tossed a ball to them, would they be able to catch it? Um, I can't give you a, a clear answer. I, I, I think it might be somewhere near the limit of abilities. Um, but I, perhaps I can, you know, I, I'm full of irrelevancies and I take off in all directions. Okay. Um, uh, but there's another sort of blind person who can catch a ball. And this is someone who is, um, um, in whom the input from a video camera uh, will go to a 10 by 10 grid of electrodes on the tongue. And um, 
the tongue seems to be the most sensitive for this. And um, uh, so first one then has a sort of t tongue vision, or you can tongue space and objects around you. And this then becomes as if visual and, and purely visual things like zooming and looming and, and uh, turning and perspective. And um, one could probably do a good deal better with um, anatomically. There's no reason why one shouldn't have a, a thousand electrodes on the tongue. Thank you. Yeah, let's go ahead. So one common thread through a lot of your writing is the really amazing ability of people uh, to adapt to um, disabilities. And I was just wondering, in, in your experience, are there particular um, uh, traits of or characteristics of people that make them better or worse um, able to adapt to these sorts of things? Um, well, <clears throat> there's adaptation at, at every level. And um, all sorts of adaptations are, are quite automatic. Um, um, I mean, to, to give you a, a non-neurological example, um, uh, at one time it would be found that if um, that elderly people might have a rather slow pulse, and you you would you would give them thyroid to make the pulse quicker, but that would drive them into heart failure or worse. And one realizes that the slow pulse is a is, is an adaptation to to um, to being old and having less cardiac reserve. Um, the um, adaptation, uh, the people who survived concentration camps, you know, to go to the other extreme, um, uh, tended to have firm but quiet faith, like Quakers. Um, um, but in general, <clears throat> I think it, it may just depend on one's, one's, one's openness as, as an individual. Um, and, um, and also trying to do things. For example, um, I was a stereo buff, an ardent member of the New York Stereoscopic Society before this happened. <clears throat> like many people there, I think I <coughs> depended excessively and sometimes almost exclusively on binocular cues. Uh, and now I've lost that. I have to learn uh, to do better with monocular cues. Um, I'm not, not doing as well as I should. Um, that's partly because I'm old. But in fact, adaptation and learning continue till, till the moment of death. Um, you may never know. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to jump ahead. Um, I've, um, yeah, I'll mention the tongue again. Um, the, um, one of the people I describe in the book um, was a novelist, a, a very good crime novelist, who came down to breakfast one morning and then went out to get the, the paper, the Toronto Globe and Star, and found it unintelligible. It seemed to be written in some peculiar language which he compared to Korean and to Serbo-Croat, to something. Um, this was devastating for him. He was able to write. People who have the sort of alexia can write freely, but they can't read what they've written. Um, but after a month or so, he found he could very slowly read handwriting uh, in fact, handwriting rather better than printing. And he thought he was getting better. But when he was tested, there was zero neurological recovery. But what was going on was, for start with the finger, was that he was involuntarily and unconsciously copying the shapes of letters with his tongue on the back of his teeth or the roof of his mouth. So he was reading by tongue writing. So the, so the tongue is useful. <laughs> I, um, there are a lot of stories about the tongue. I did, I did, I, when I wrote a visual book, I didn't expect the tongue to come in <laughs> twice, as a, as both as a sensory organ and as a motor organ. Essentially, I don't know if you've ever seen um, maps 
of, of how the human body is represented in the brain, but there's a thing called uh, the sensory homunculus, which has an enormous tongue and hand, and the motor homunculus is rather similar. I, I'm sorry, I'm, 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 I'm getting away completely from... No, this is what this is about. Uh, still on the topic of uh, vision and adaptation. Yeah. I remember one of the patients from uh, an anthropologist on Mars where somebody who had lost their vision uh, at a very, very young age and then it was repaired uh, when the, the person was an adult. And I think they were having trouble uh, redeveloping the, the part of the mind that, that processes vision. So I was wondering, you know, what do we know about our ability to learn things that we would have learned normally at a very young age? Yeah. Is the adult brain generally able to, to recover some of those functions or adapt in a totally different way to, to get the same functionality, or how does that work? Um, well, uh, sort of uh, notions of uh, an optimal age and a critical age and a, and a small window um, uh, have, um, have lost a little bit of their strength. Now, in fact, someone whom you know um, uh, there are a number of languageless deaf people um, who, uh, who have never been exposed to formal sign language and who just develop a, a repertoire of a few gestures or home sign. Um, a friend and colleague of mine, and now of yours, um, wrote me some years ago about a 27-year-old man and his acquisition of language. And um, it was all very puzzling and sort of un unchomsky like but, 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 but the notion of, uh, of this has been extended um, with, um, I'm sorry, sort of everything seemed, and with the particular man you refer to, um, uh, sight was probably poorish when he was born and non-existent after a few months. And when he was given sight at the age of 50, um, he, um, uh, he, 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 he couldn't make anything of it. When they, um, when they sort of took the bandages off um, and he seemed to be staring vacantly and they, and they end it wasn't until the surgeons had well, uh, and then he slowly homed in because he knew that voices come from faces. Um, but but at that time, all he could see were um, um, variously pink surfaces and, and 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 some movement. That he thought, is this seeing? See, so he hadn't learned to see, he hadn't learned to recognize, um, which normally one does in the first weeks and months of life, and everything is correlated and sight is correlated with other senses. In fact, he, um, he did, did very badly, and, uh, um, and it was a relief to him although regarded as, as a tragedy by others, when he then lost his sight again. Um, but uh, others, other, others can adapt pretty well. So there are, there are other cases of people who have successfully relearned how to see when oh, the, um, the physical yeah, um, uh, yeah. repair occurred? Um, you know? um, there, um, uh, there, there are now some better cases, and things don't look as as hopeless as as, as they did. Um, the um, oh, there are all sorts of other things, but I, I mustn't. Inspired by a father in one of your books, who said of his daughter, I, autistic daughter, I believe, yeah. she loves us as much as she can. Would you define quote unquote human? by more intellectual characteristics or emotional ones, which aspect do we more tightly identify with? Mm. This is not my question. Yeah. I oh. Mean, this is a Googler question. Oh, oh I see, yeah. Um, the, um, 
emotion is certainly crucial for for bonding, and bonding is crucial for for becoming human. Um, the uh, uh, people who have children with Down syndrome f find no difficulty, you know, can adore their children and be adored by them. There can be emotional fullness, even though there's, there are fairly severe intellectual limitations. With this young autistic girl, uh, it was the, the other way around. Um, but uh, um, I, uh, there is um, well, the, the, there's no one, no one on, on, on the planet. That, uh, there's no human being on the planet at the moment who, uh, who, who hasn't. Yeah, the human beings who, uh, who are furthest from the criteria of being human uh, are feral children who've been put out in the forest and have somehow survived, whether they're nurtured by wolves like Mowgli or whatever, I don't know, but um, um, uh, people like this have, uh, uh, have no language, apparently no capacity for getting language. Um, and uh, and, and severe intellectual limitations, and um, I think they are, uh, there's a clumsy way of saying that a huge amount of being human depends on culture. Um, you can't have a human being without, without culture, whereas I think you can have a cat without culture. <laughs> And, uh, and, and maybe an, an ape, or, or, although says obviously some degree of, cu of culture and training occurs everywhere. I, I think I would define human beings in terms of, um, uh, of self-consciousness, the consciousness of um, themselves as a distinct person and, um, and, and of having a life and of looking back on the life in anticipating death. I don't know whether other animals anticipate death. There's something, you just made me think of this, so now I'm going to read this. At the very end of the book, you write the following. Language, that most human invention, can enable what, in principle, should not be possible. It can allow all of us, even congenitally blind, to see with another person's eyes. So somehow I, I thought of that as you were speaking, that it's, it's, you don't exist in isolation, but you're actually experiencing you can experience through others. Yeah, um, well, well, certainly um, Helen Keller's autobiography is full of a vivid, as if visual and auditory um, descriptions. And... Um, uh, but is this another thing that kind of makes us human? It's, it's the cultural, but it's the language and... Oh, 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 um, abs absolutely. Um, um, and and also gesture. The um, uh, ape, apes gesture a little, but only very little. And uh, uh, gesture and music and language are, are, are almost exclusively human. That's interesting, because one of the first things that Ildefonso, who was Susan Schaller's subject, a 27-year-old who was deaf, and didn't learn until she worked extensively with him to help him get the concept of naming. That is, I guess it was cat was the first word that he learned as naming something, that he immediately started pointing, gesturing, which struck me as something that, like you mm. said, apes don't do. But even almost just at the cusp of linguistic behavior, he was pointing. Uh, um, the um, uh, Merlin D Donald, um, uh, who is a, a remarkable psychologist, um, thinks that there's a whole cognitive cultural stage which he calls mimetic. Um, uh, and, and we still have this, although now we've gone on to, he speaks of, of ape culture as episodic and, and then mimetic, and then our culture as partly theoretic. 
but it's highly mimetic as well. And one of the stories I tell in here is of an intelligent woman who became severely aphasic and, and lost the use of expressive language and wasn't very good at, at understanding language, but she became a sort of genius of, of, of gesture, uh, both of understanding people's gestures and expressions and, and her own, uh, assisted by a word list. She couldn't get a sentence, but she could have various words. But it's, it's incredible how much, uh, and also how it uh, can be conveyed by, by mimesis, but, but also how, how, how little. You, you can't make a proposition. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to say the, the cat is on the mat, or you know, let alone anything more complex. Yeah, yeah, I'm uh, curious. Given what you've learned and potentially what you would like to learn, um, what could we do to make Google more useful to you? Um, what should you? Um, well, I love receiving letters from people uh, telling me of their situations. Um, I, this sometimes becomes over, overwhelming, and, and my assistant Haley and, and, and Kate, who is with me, have to sort of sort these out. But um, I is that. Uh, but um, can, can you? Um, I'm sorry. Can you clarify for me the sort of help you actually, have in mind? Actually, uh, sort of imagine that you are in charge of Google engineering. Wow. What would you, what would you have us build? What would you have us change if you were in charge? Well, I'm afraid I don't know very much about Google engineering. <laughs> um, you know, I'm I'm a creature who still uses a fountain pen, and a, and a two finger typewriter, and I'm 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 not. Um, Although, um, yes, you're, you're the search engine, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. we, we do a bit of that. Yeah. <laughs> right. Well, um, uh, you, you would have to tell me more about Google, and then I might be able to answer your question. And another time. Thank okay. you. Sorry, uh, this, uh, this question is about adaptations, again. Um, so there, there's, there's ones that are taught, like the tongue electrode example. And then there's ones that people sort of... Sorry, a, a bit slower. Oh, sorry. Um, so there, the, there are adaptations that are taught, like the tongue electrode example with the mapping. Um, and then there are ones that people come up with automatically. So between those two, um, in your experience, does one work better than the other usually? And, and are the automatic ones universal enough that we could learn something from that to kind of like guide the neuroplasticity of like basically teach them better? Um. Uh, yeah, well, certainly the the automatic ones are, are, are the first to to alter the brain, um, either by activating latent or dormant connections, and then perhaps later by 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 major changes. Um, but uh, you know, but 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 all learning alters the brain, whether, you know, whether it's automatic or not. I, I, I may have missed part of your question, I'm sorry. Uh, no, I was just wondering if, if, there's, um, if there's something that's universal about the automatic adaptations that people do, that we could learn something from that to, to teach it better. Uh, to, to, teach. to teach it better. To teach it better. Teach it better. Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure how, I mean, s let me be specific. Um, uh, if you are reduced to, monoc to monocularity, you will start to deal with monocular cues like perspective and occlusion better. Um, but, uh, but this also needs to be taught to some extent and uh, um, I, I'm sorry, I'm not quite sure how to deal with the question. I'm probably inverting it. Thank you. 
Um, some years ago, there was a, a fellow who put together a belt made out of pagers. And the ones. Of what? Pagers, you know, those little things that buzz when you get a phone call. Yeah, yeah I've heard of them. Yeah. And <laughs> the one that was facing north would buzz. And he said after a while, he gave oh. himself a sort of inherent compass, a sense of north and south. Yeah. And you've heard of this? That when he took it off, he became disoriented and so forth? Uh, a lot of what you talked about, the majority of what you talk about is um, how to cope with some form of pathology. But you know, we've seen that in some ways it's possible to, that, yeah. that these systems of adaptation also work in healthy people, mm -hmm. that you can, in a limited yeah. sense, manufacture new senses. Yeah. Do you see this as being useful? Um, well, uh, although I don't mention it in the book, it happens that Stereo Sue, yeah. um, uh, whose husband was an astronaut uh, and who herself uh, lacks uh, any sense of direction, but she is much helped by a magnetic hat, uh, which, uh, which her husband designed, which, uh, uh, which emits a beep when, um, when she is facing north. And uh, this is this is when she wears this, she gets a feeling of of a magnetic field. She feels, you know, she's she's almost as a good as a as an insect or a bird with magnetite globules in in the brain. Um, but when she takes the hat off, I don't think there's any residue. There's a great video on YouTube. Sorry. There's a great video on YouTube where she describes. She oh, really? The hat. I, I didn't know that. Yeah. She's getting around. <laughs> uh, yes, I must speak to her about that. <laughs> it's um, that hat. Yeah. No, I, 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 um, I, I, I had a, um, uh, an experience which startled me some years ago when I, um, uh, I, I'm very fond of the, um, of the, of the powerful rare earth magnets, and I, I had a whole a whole pocket full of them, and as you know, they tend to align themselves with the Earth's magnetic field. And I, I was walking, and as I turned around a corner, I felt a shifting in my pocket, uh, you know, as, as if there was an animal there. And, and I, I, I then wondered about perhaps, you know, putting things on the rim of one's glasses or one's ears. Um, uh, New, new senses. Um, would you like some new senses? <laughs> it couldn't hurt. Uh, well, well, that's the question. Um, <laughs> the, um, now, uh, with a friend and colleague of mine who was congenitally totally colorblind, but, but in, intrigued by the um, by what colour seemed to mean for, for the rest of us. And I, I, I once asked him, in fact, several times, I said, if it were possible, if we could give you colour, would, would, would you like it? And um, he said no, he said because he had constructed, or his brain had constructed, a complete world uh, in terms of, of luminosity and outline and texture and movement and depth, and color would have no meaning and it would, would confuse him. Uh, and then I asked my question again and he turned on me and he said, would you like X-ray vision? <laughs> and I thought and, and shuddered a bit and said, no, I'm, I'm okay as I am. And he said, and he said so, so am I. Um, but, um, uh, but nonetheless, if, if one could perhaps optionally have, have some, some senses. A, um, a friend of mine who, uh, who was born with cataracts and had them operated on fairly young, but he doesn't have implanted lenses, he has these old-fashioned, very thick glasses, he once told me that he could see a little way into the ultraviolet and in particular that he could see the honey guides uh, on flowers which bees use. And I said, well, what's, what's ultraviolet like? Salivating. And, um, and he said he could no more tell me than I could tell him what stereoscopy was like, which, which he doesn't have. Um, 
I mean, th this by way of saying there's, a, there's an infinite gulf between experience and description. Um, but what sensors would you like? I mean, maybe Google could help. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, do we have time for one more question? One more question? Okay, apologies to, sorry. Uh, given the nature of your uh, work, you've dealt with people who've had senses and then lost them or lost them and gained them, think in different ways, adapt and cope. How has that affected the way you view your humanity, your senses, your capabilities? Uh, so how is? How have you, how has your experience with dealing with these people who have different capabilities affected how you personally look at your own capabilities? Um, I'm still missing things. Uh, um, uh, are you saying uh, how is my coping compared to theirs? How do you, no. No. how do you view yourself differently? Given your experience with these other people, who, oh. am I saying that? Um, yeah. Well, I, I, I think often I, um, I, I, I would hope that if if what has happened to them happened to me, I would, I, I, I would do as, as well as they. Mm. Um, I've, um, I mean, I'm, one of the reasons I've given my own case history in the book as well as others is, you know, is partly to, to compare things. But um, I think what I want to say is that um, coping strategies should be shared and broadcast. For example, one of, um, one of my stories is about face blindness or difficulty recognizing faces, which, which I have fairly severely, some people have overwhelmingly. Um, others may have it quite severely but not even know it because they have so automatically used other cues of, of, of voice and, and, and dress and posture and context. Um, but um, uh, strategies for dealing with, with face blindness should, should be widely known. And uh, is that the, that's not the sort of thing Google does. <laughs> no. It can. Actually. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. Um, so, um, uh, so I, um, I, you know, I mean, all culture and civilization depends on, on borrowing and learning and sharing. And I, and I think this, this needs to be so for adaptations. Well, on that thank note, you. thank you very much for okay. coming to do this. Thank you. Thank you.